Hello, everyone. It's Sid here from Fundamental Research. Our guest today is Daniel Major, the CEO of Govx Uranium. Govx holds a portfolio of uranium assets in Africa with combined measure and indicator resource of 126 million pounds and an infer resource of 83 million pounds of uranium. Its portfolio is one of the largest held by a Canadian junior. Uh, one of the unique aspects of Govx is that it is one of the very few TSX or TSX relisted companies offering exposure to uranium in Africa. So the agenda for today is I'll kick off the call with our thoughts on the sector and current valuations. Daniel will take over from there and introduce us to GoVX and its uh, upcoming plans. Listeners, you can either wait till the end to ask questions or if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to type them in and we'll try to respond to them. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, the Horizon Global Uranium Index ETF is up 80% this year and 240% since the beginning of 2020. The number one reason for this uh, is a spike in uranium prices. As you can see here, uranium prices are up 50% year to date. We believe that prices are up due to two key factors. Number one, temporary supply disruptions due to the pandemic. And number two is increasing number of uranium producers and institutions purchasing the metal from spot markets, betting on higher prices in the future. Another factor that's driving optimism in the sector is a global movement towards clean energy. Uranium or nuclear is one of the cleanest sources of energy. Here is a snapshot of the industry. Over 440 nuclear re reactors are in operations globally. Uranium supply primarily comes from Kazakhstan, Australia, and Canada. The planned and under construction reactors will bring the total number of existing reactors to 597, which is a 35% increase from current levels. China's commitment to reduce its carbon footprint is expected to result in a significant increase in nuclear demand. In addition, Biden's proposed uh, infrastructure and climate plan includes initiatives to revive uranium production. As shown by both charts here, the market, the uranium market is estimated to be in a deficit over the long term. Now, we have a positive outlook on uranium due to a number of factors. Number one is that nuclear energy is a dependable and clean power source. Number two, uranium has no direct substitute for use in nuclear power plants. Uh, another point is that a major concern regarding the supply of uranium is that it typically takes over 10 years from discovery to production for a uranium mine. Although capital costs are high, nuclear power plants have lower operating costs compared to other power plants. Uh, bottom line, we believe prices need to be at least $50 a pound uranium in order to incentivize idled and new projects to come online. This chart, uh, beautifully explains or uh, why we believe so. You can see here that a lot of uh, supply, new supply, uh, has an operating cost of over forty dollars a pound. Finally, let's take a look at valuations in space. Uranium Juniors are trading at about five point nine dollars a pound. That's based on hundred percent of measured and indicated and fifty percent of inferred resources held by companies. GoVX is trading at a steep discount at just $1.4 a pound. With that, I would like to welcome Daniel, the CEO of GoVX. Daniel, you'll be able to share your screen in a second. Thank you very much. And uh, see if I can get this technology to work suitably. There we go. And we'll put it into full screen. So just bear with me. Take your time, Daniel. Yeah. There we go. Um, hopefully you can all see that. And uh, let me just take you and give you a brief overview. And then I know Sid wants to do some Q&A uh, at the end of it. So normal disclaimers. Um, and then really, as, as Sid said, we are an, an Africa focused company. Uh, all of our projects are in Africa. Uh, one of the key apps, items that sets us apart is two of our projects. Uh, and we do have three projects. Most people only have one, but two of them are actually fully permitted uh, and are ready for development subject to completion of their final FSs and financing on those projects. As Sid said, we've got a very large mineral resource, uh, but we've also got a considerable amount of exploration upside on all of our properties. 
We like being in Africa. We find it a very straightforward mining friendly jurisdictions uh, with a lot of skill sets. We've seen problems in Peru recently where Hochschild's been threatened by having two of its mines closed. Even in the Athabascas, the indigenous people are starting to raise concerns related to the number of proposed uranium mines being built. But in Africa, these are commodity driven countries uh, and their focus is on getting mine development. I'll pass on the comments. So this slide deck is on our present uh, our website, so you can pick them up from there. But the very positive view that we see on the market with a very limited supply, strong demand coming through, which is increasing, means that new supply is demanded. Uh, and we're looking at big supply deficits going forward. And where Goviex positions itself is as a developer, we're looking to develop our mines, Maduela and Niger first, to fill in part of that supply market, then Matanga to follow thereafter. And because they're permitted, we can put these plans into pace. It's purely technical and financial to finish off. Our Maduela project is right up in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Uh, but fortunately, it's next to two mining towns, Arlet and Akukan, that were built by the French mining company Urano back in the early 70s and have produced almost 150,000 tonnes of uranium since then, making Niger for many years the fourth largest mining jurisdiction in the world. Uh, we have roads there, we have power, we have trained people looking for jobs, and importantly, we have water, something that's a struggle in Namibia, uh, despite the fact it is next to the sea. Um, in April of this year, we put out an updated pre-feasibility study that was focused on simplifying the project, getting it ready for debt servicing to making sure that the project that we were presenting would be um, debt serviceable. Um, it also made it clear where we were going to take it into final feasibility. So, And since then, we've been pushing through final feasibility study. We're expecting to finish in Q2 of next year. This is a low cost project. Uh, certainly from an Africa perspective. We also have the government as Niger um, as a shareholder. They own 20% of the company, 10% uh, is a free carry and 10% we did a transaction back in 2019 where we owed them over $14 million and they suggested that that be cancelled in exchange for them getting a 10% stake. They are hoping we'll buy that back in the future. But I think it shows a pragmatism of government that's willing to negotiate to ensure that projects get developed. In Zambia, uh, we have 100% ownership of the Matanga project. It's straightforward. It's two projects that had previously gone to pre-feasibility study that were merged together. Uh, this is a very much part of the Karoo Rift um, structures that are coming through on uranium. Uh, again, good infrastructure here. We're very close to Lusaka. We're close to the main road out to Wolfis Bay, close to Acid. Uh, and into Zimbabwe. Uh, again, a very simple project, low stripping ratio, low acid consumption, big resource like Madawela. This is a long life project already with a lot of exploration upside. Uh, Matanga happens to be the, also the lowest capital intensive project on the African continent at the moment for uranium development. And then we have our Falea project. This is pure exploration. Uh, this company actually used to belong to a company called Rockgate that in 2011, when the uranium spot market was last at $70, was a $300 million market com cap company on its own. Um, it's gone all the way to PFS internally, so a lot of technical research has been done on it because it's interesting because it has copper and silver credits. It's got about 0.2% of copper and about 70 gram a ton of silver. Um, it's also on two major gold trends. Uh, we've been doing further work looking at the IP that's sitting underneath it and realize that actually the whole feeder structure has never been explored here. And potentially we're looking at a much, much, much larger deposit right underneath with a lot of potential over the total license area. Uh, that one uh, core sample, for example, on the bottom left is, is chalcopyrite that was in the bottom of a hole that was actually never sampled by the previous owners. Uh, we've restructured our board recently, got it ready for development. We are very focused on bringing our minds through. We are well cashed up. Um, we continue to get uh, warrants being exercised um, and very much preparing ourselves. And as Sid said, you know, we are very much undervalued relative to our peers 
uh, from a development point of view. And the point I would make for investors is that in the previous cycles, um, in the 2004 to 2007 cycle, it's been the companies that have gone from developer to producer that has given the best share equity returns. And in the 2011 cycle, it was the companies that were taken out. And three of those substantial transactions were all in Africa. And so really, just a summary, we're very strong on the uranium market. We've structured our team, very much an experienced team. Uh, we've got long life projects. We've got a substantial resource. We've got a lot of exploration upside in front of us. So thank you very much. And, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Daniel. You can now open the call to a Q&A. Listeners, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in or you can click on the raise hand option and can unmute you. Uh, so while we get uh, the questions, Daniel, one of the questions um, I was asked uh, when we initiated coverage on the company is what are really the pros and cons in developing uranium resources in Africa? I think the, the, the pros very much, um, I mean, if you look at Niger, it took us four, six months to get our mining permit. Um, the same in Zambia, you're, you're dealing with governments who generally own the, the country. These are governments, as I said, they're very much GDP driven for, through commodity growth. So it's a big part of, you know, how these countries grow. Um, Africa's developed, uh, you know, over the years, there's a lot of skills. We run a 100% local employment strategy because we can, um, at, you know, and those skills are there. Africa's opening up as a free trade continent. So there's very much a focus on expanding infrastructure that's out there. The, the negatives, um, distance is one of the problems. Things do take a long time. Um, some of the, you know, customs can be a bit slow, but generally I tend to find the, the pro, I, I think also people's perception of Africa, um, which I believe is wrong, uh, I think is one of the negatives. And I think there is enough other noise, as I said in the presentation regarding like Hogshield, two mines being closed potentially. It just shows there is a lot of other political risk elsewhere. People just don't take the time to really look at Africa. If I may add, uh, I should also mention that Niger accounts for 5% of global uranium production and is the second largest uh, producer in Africa behind Namibia and sixth largest globally. And the other countries that uh, GOBX operates in Mali and Zambia were ranked sec second and seventh best mining jurisdictions in Africa in 2020 by the Fraser Institute. What, why is that there are fewer uranium explorers and developers in Africa, you know, when compared to Australia or Canada or other areas? Uh there are several. I mean, there's a lot of Australian listed ones. I mean, the, in the Canadian market, there are very few. Uh, I mean, you're really looking at two, two real jurisdictions. You're looking at the Namibian jurisdiction. Um, there were quite a few there with the Chinese bought out in the last cycle. Uh, you look at, uh, you know, um, extract that was purchased out, what, 2.4 billion. Um, Makuja River was purchased uh, out in Tanzania for 1.2 billion in the last cycle. The French have obviously had a strong control over what's been going on in Niger for a long time until sort of it opened up, which is when Goviex turned up and, and Global Atomic. Um, so, you know, it, there are big projects out there, um, but at the moment, obviously, for most Canadians, the focus has been on, on the Athabasca. Another the thing that or aspect that stands out of the African projects, uh, they are relatively of lower grade versus uh, the projects in the Athabasca Basin. But the capex is lower as well. How do you compare the economics uh, in for African projects versus, you know, well-known projects in Australia or Canada? Yeah, I, I mean, if you compare us to certainly the Australian projects, the African projects are, are really strong. I mean, comparing to you know someone like a, a Denison with its ISR with its exceedingly high grades, you know, it's hard to compare. But I think the other side that you have to look at this as well is. You know, these are projects that are only just starting their permitting phase, and there is no guarantee that they would get their permits. Um, you know, and particularly, as I said, you know, it was only a, a week ago that the indigenous uh, groups in the Athabascas were questioning whether they wanted more than two uranium mines in that jurisdiction. Um, so, you know, the African mines, 
have their place. I mean, we're all competing against the Kazakhs. And I think what was interesting in a recent presentation, the Kazakhs made it very clear two things. One, that their existing mines have a finite life and they literally fall off a cliff in early 2030. And their next round of projects are nothing like their current projects and that the utility should not be expecting it to be an easy win to get new Kazakh projects up and going uh, because they're very different. Got it. That really helps, Daniel. You mentioned Denison. Denison is also a significant in in uh, investor in GoVX. Yep. What is their involvement in addition to being a shareholder? Uh, as we've moved further down the pipeline, it, it has become less. Uh, Dave Cates is though is on our board and is, I have to say, is an exceptionally good director. Um, certainly, you know, holds us to task on on a lot of issues that we're doing. Uh, but we've obviously kind of moved in different directions as companies. Um, I have a lot of time with Dave Cates where I can see what's happening in his area of market. So we share a lot of, you know, information between the companies. We've uh, reviewed or we have been in the space analyzing companies for 18 years. We have reviewed over 500 companies, uh, juniors. And I should say that GoVX is one of the best management teams slash directors uh, in, in the in the sector. Uh, Daniel, if you don't mind, can we quickly touch on who is in the board, who is uh, in the management team? Uh, yeah, um, obviously myself. <laughs> um, Govin Friedland uh, clearly um, is the founder, um, Robert Friedland's son. Um, Govin saw an opportunity back in 2007. His background is geology, but obviously working under his father for a long time, saw an opportunity, uh, as his father always said to him, if you're going to mine something out of the ground, mine something the Chinese want. Um, on the board, we have people like Ben Wallace-Sal, um, who's the guy who really founded Semaphone, really helped open up West African gold. Uh, we've got David Cates. Uh, Chris Wallace has a strong background in the debt markets. Um, we have um, Salma Sereto. Uh, her background is a lawyer, but she also works as part of the team for Societe Generale. Uh, that finance the Paladin mines. Uh, and she's subsequently gone on to run her own businesses in Africa, particularly West Africa. So we got a lot of political contacts and support in West Africa. And then Eric Kraft, um, a very wealthy businessman, in his own right, a big investor in GoVX. But he's also a big investor into kind of rare earth, uranium stocks uh, in general. So a very smart man uh, in his own right. And we, and we changed that board this year, Sid, as well, to kind of really start focusing on the board that needs to be there to help develop the mine. Thank you, Daniel. I should add that management directors, Denison, Robert Friedland, and Cameco combined own more than 25% of GoVX's uh, equity. Um, another question that just came in, what should uranium prices be for you to make a production decision on one of your mines? Okay, the, the both of our PFS or well, PFS and PEA have both been done at 55, which gets the, the trigger that we wanted to do it. What we're currently doing on the FS, obviously, is seeing how we can currently bring those costs down uh, even further to kind of uh, focus on it. We used 55 because certainly the communications from Cameco have been very much we want to see something with a five in front of it to justify reopening MacArthur River. The Kazakhs have always said that they would tend to keep their production below 20% below as long as the tier one asset is shut being MacArthur River. So, you know, I very much have a view that we're going to sit, you know, see that duopoly looking to stabilize prices between 50 and $60 long-term contract, which happens to be, actually the long-term pricing going quite a long way back for the utilities anyway. So, you know, we positioned ourselves to work there. Um, and that's very much, in, in fact, when you saw the spot price hit $50 not so long ago, the 2025 long-term price was $55, which is the price we've been using for our model to justify construction. Uh, we do look at a lot of projects around. Uh, we obviously did uh, acquisitions back in 2016 and 2017 when we added our own. At the moment, we're very much focused on trying to get our own projects off the ground. You know, management has only got so much time uh, in a day to focus on everything. 
would we be open to putting other projects in if they were in the right time frame um, and the right positioning strategically for us then absolutely it would make a lot of logical sense i mean we put together a a project with a pipeline of projects so that you know once we've got one going we knew where the next growth uh, was coming in from going forward do you see govx continue to be an african story or do you plan to expand outside no i think there's a, a considerable amount of opportunity in africa and i think the other point we haven't talked about is there are currently 14 different countries in africa who want to go nuclear um, and are in various stages of that development and education uh, going forward. And they range from Zambia all the way across to Ghana. Uh, there's only one nuclear country. And, you know, with a, with a continent with, you know, long-term growth at 6%, uh, it needs to get its, its energy growth up. There's, it currently relies fully on carbon fuel pretty well uh, and some hydro um, hydro is pretty well tapped out. So, you know, you are looking at Africa being a certainly a new area, particularly for the small modular reactors. So I think, you know, why would we move away from an area that's potentially got a growing market around us anyway, where, you know, countries will be wanting to make sure they have a, a line of sight for their own uranium. Got it. Richard finally sent us, uh, typed in his question. Um, who are the closest peers, comparables? Uh, if you look at the African ones, um, you'd be looking obviously at Global Atomic because they're next door to us. Um, you would look at Deep Yellow, Bannerman down in in um, Namibia. Those would be kind of the, the three that come straight off the top of my head. Now, in our report, which you published in August, that's the initiating report on GovX, we have highlighted a list of uh, uranium juniors, both in Africa and outside Africa. You can also see the multiples of African juniors and uh, you know juniors operating outside Africa. So, if any one of you have not seen our report, please check out our platform researchfrc.com and check for GoVX, and you'll be able to see our reports, all of all of our reports from GoVX. Um, going forward, is your main focus developing the existing projects or pursue M and A? I think you already touched upon the MA, but uh, is it fair to say that all of your focus is currently on developing the two advanced stage projects? Uh, exactly. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, the best way you add value to projects is to keep moving them forward and extract, seeing where you can extract value. What I will say is that those projects that we discussed that were taken out previously were all taken out when they were structuring their debt and looking to become developers back in 2011, 2012. So, you know, you keep going down that path. If you don't, you're not putting the effort in that you need to put in. So we very much focus on being a developer. Um, that's where we see the most value. If somebody wants to pay us an amount of money that's far greater than we think we're worth, then clearly we would look at an exit. Got it. There are a few questions uh, more specifically on country risk yeah. um, regarding change of government, terrorism, yeah. corruption. Uh, yeah. If you don't mind, maybe a, some color uh, on the areas you operate would be very helpful, Daniel. No, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and if we go around, I'll start in the south uh, and then move up. Um, so if we start with Zambia, I mean, Zambia has gone through some, some interesting times, but Zambia is very robust as a country. Um, you know, the, the mines and operations and even even, you know, we've had some issues in Zambia, but at the end of the day, it is pragmatic. Um, it needs development. It wants production of, of minerals. It's trying to diversify. Uh, certainly the new government in Zambia is very focused on getting the mining operations, privatization, getting new money um, coming in. If you look at Niger, Niger has been producing uranium since 1971. Um, we've been there since 2007, never had an issue. Uranium's come out of there since then. Uh, Niger elected a new president back in December. Uh, you know, it's got one of the longest running democracies uh, in Africa. Uh, it's a very stable country. I mean, I thoroughly enjoy going there. Mali clearly has got problems at the moment, and, and those 
problems are spilling across the border, um, combined with Burkina Faso and we, into, into Niger. But it is very much a border issue, and it's very much focused around predominantly the gold mines. Um, but Niger is, is very strong uh, in the region as well. Uh, and certainly the, the new president uh, who I've met is a, you know, a very robust fellow and, and takes a very clear view of where he wants his country to grow. Africa is well known for countries or governments taking a good piece on the assets they have. Um, do you want to also quickly talk yeah. on the ownership? Well, I mean, Zambia, we'd have, you know, 100 percent. There's, you know, I see no reason why the government would want to nationalize that at all, uh, that we've not had any indications of that. In Mali and in um, Niger, it's built into the mining code. The mining code hasn't changed since 2006 as well. So in the past, they used to take a stake uh, above the 10% free carry. The government of Niger tends not to do that anymore. Uh, it's realized that companies are very good at um, ensuring that the, the cash flows are used for growth and they don't pay dividends. So they are, are very much like, no, we'll take our 10%, we'll have our royalties. You know, as I said earlier, you know, we found the government to be very pragmatic in everything that we've done with them. Um, and certainly it's a government that is not looking to own or operate mines. Uh, they very much, you know, they're, they're not rich enough um, as a country. They, they're they very key for them. And, and a lot of what you see with Niger particularly is pushing out to get private money in. Uh, the mining code um, is very much an FDI, you know, foreign direct investment structure. Um, you know, you can own things, you can operate them uh, just within the rules. And the mining code is pretty standard. There's nothing there that's, you know, would, would frighten you at all that you expect in any other country. Got it. Finally, why do you think COVX is trading well below its uh, comparables? Even if you look at African juniors, uh, GOVX's multiples are below their multiples. Why do you think that's happening? And number two, what are your upcoming catalysts? Yeah, I, mean, I think if you look, be careful with, with, with the, cat, the ones you look at. I, I did a look at the Australian stocks um, myself, and they're already pricing in $65. Um, if you look at their NPVs, they were reporting, whereas the Canadian stocks tend to be, uh, and there's less of us in Africa anyway, aren't even pricing in the $50 number. Um, if you, some of them though, be careful because they actually have assets that are built. So someone like a Paladin uh, has already got a plant built. So you do have to look through those uh, valuations. Uh, do I think we are undervalued? Yes. Do I see us a lot of upside value? Yes. You know, as I made the point earlier, you know, Falea alone was worth 300 million back in 2011 as a, a single asset. So there's a lot of upside to be had uh, in GoVX. And, you know, we will achieve, in my view, you know, and that's our target is to get to the development stage for Maduella. And, and that's where that re-rate will come through anyway. Got it. And the upcoming catalysts? Uh, upcoming catalyst, obviously, it's coming into Christmas. It's going to be quiet now, but going into next year, we'll be doing some drilling in Mali, focused on the underlying target. There, uh, we're targeting Q2 for obviously the completion of the FS. We've already brought the deck guys on for Endeavor. We've already brought on the chief marketing guy, so we've got in place all the structures now. That once that FS in place we can kick into gear to structure out the debt and then find the equity that goes with it. So, you know, it's all kind of happening in the first half of the year. And that FS is the, is the real driving force for us. Okay. I don't see any more questions, uh, Daniel, any final thoughts? Um, yeah, I think uh, as you kind of said earlier, I think, you know, we've seen some interesting things in the market this year, things like spot, but I think the one point that I would say we were at the NEI conference recently and the utilities themselves, are looking at the bigger issue, which is there is a lack of supply out in front and they need to start securing long term contracts. And the, we are seeing an increasing number of long term RFPs coming out. There was a dearth of them for about five or six years, but now they're starting to appear 
and with an de increasing degree of vengeance. So the utilities are really going to be the ones that finally drive this long-term contracting market. It is starting to see. GoVX has obviously got its projects permitted. We've just got to finish off the technicals, get them where we want them, and secure the financing that needs to be done. And we see very much that we have that potential, uh, that by 2025, uh, Niger should be producing uranium. And two years after that, we'd expect Zambia to be producing uranium. Really appreciate your insights, Daniel. Thank you so much. And to everyone on the call for taking time today, a recording will be uploaded on our YouTube channel shortly. Please ensure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and also sign up to a member of our platform, researchfrc.com. You get alerts when we publish new reports. And of course, you'll be able to see our list of top picks. Thanks again and wish you all the best and stay safe.